good. Nothing. I'm very pleased to see you all here in this uh, splendid new room for uh, the first OTP guest lecture uh, ever in, this, uh, in our new housing. We have a special guest today whom I've been following for a long time, ever since I uh, discovered uh, one of his uh, books, uh, The Emerging System of International Criminal Law, that uh, I really enjoyed, and that I thought was very inspiring, and uh, also very instructive for, uh, for someone who, at that moment, conveniently had to get uh, used to and familiar with uh, many of the topics that he treated. Uh, so thank you very much for that, Lyle. It uh, has been very uh, helpful for me, and I really enjoyed reading it. And uh, in that vein, I was also uh, particularly pleased to uh, realize that you had uh, more or less full-time established at The Hague and uh, uh, would uh, flexibly be able to make yourself available for uh, a guest lecture here uh, in our series. And uh, once we got in contact, uh, it was also really nice to notice how uh, enthusiastic you were to uh, take up that invitation and uh, upon uh, a little bit of delay caused by the fact that uh, when we first organized it, it had to be cancelled uh, because uh, uh, in the last week of November, when it was originally foreseen, uh, there were no meeting rooms uh, with uh, chairs available anymore in the art building, uh, and we didn't want to endeavor on a standing guest lecture, uh, so we decided to cancel and to postpone until uh, we had moved to the new premises. Now, finally, you're here. Uh, welcome to you, and um, I'm uh, very interested in hearing what you have to tell us uh, about the relation between uh, UN uh, fact-finding uh, work and uh, international criminal prosecution. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for being here. Well, first of all, thank you, uh, Hans, for a very, uh, very kind and, and generous. Uh, introduction. It's a great pleasure to, to be here and uh, mainly because uh, you know the whole world is aware of uh, the importance of your work and the dedication uh, with which you are bringing your energy and, and your good wishes uh, and, and, and care uh, on international criminal law to make it really work well. So it's a big honor for me to, to, uh, to accept uh, you know, the invitation and uh, uh, very kind of you to give me the time to to enter into a topic which I think is a very important one, and that's why I've chosen it, um, which gets into you know, the relationship between human rights fact-finding and international criminal prosecutions. So um, without further ado, maybe we can dim the lights a bit if it's possible. I think it's quite, it's quite visible, but it might help. Do you think it's okay? I don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> we still don't know. If, if it's easy to do, otherwise, we, uh, otherwise it's not a problem. Oh, yeah. No, I, I don't either. Well, it's quite visible in any case, right? So let's not uh, try to reinvent uh, things that we don't uh, necessarily have a handle on at this moment. So. <laughs> All right, so, okay. And um, I will try to get through the, the, the whole thing, and then we'll have time for, for questions and discussion, uh, hopefully as much as possible at the end. So, so how can human rights fact-finding sharpen international criminal prosecutions. Uh, my basic uh, point today is that, uh, on the one hand, international criminal investigations, investigators, uh, should not reject, ignore, or undervalue uh, human rights fact-finding. Uh, I'll explain you know, how that concern came about a little later on. On the other hand, UN human rights fact-finders have to bear in mind the possibility of eventual international criminal investigation. But uh, of course, UN human rights fact finding cannot substitute for international criminal investigation. In short, uh, human rights fact finding and international criminal investigations should be fully recognized as separate and distinct from each other, yet related and in some ways even interdependent. In the interest of sharpening international criminal prosecution. So I'm, I want to enlarge upon this argument uh, in order to maybe contribute in some way, uh, some small way to, to sharpening up international criminal prosecutions in some aspects. In September 1994, 
uh, OHCHR, the Office of the High Commission for Human Rights, uh, requested me to, to assist the UN Security Council's Commission of Experts in Rwanda. And those are the uh, commissioners that were in place uh, from July 26, 1994 uh, to December 31st, 1994. And our mandate was uh, to examine and analyze information uh, and provide the Secretary General with the Commission's conclusions on the evidence of grave violations of international humanitarian law committed to the territory of Rwanda, including the evidence of possible acts of genocide. It's interesting, I think, already to note, and we know this from our historical studies or international criminal law, that the Security Council, acting under Chapter 7, which is a, an international peace and security mandate, to establish a commission to investigate facts and criminal responsibility, but it's service to the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. So we already see human rights and, and uh, international criminal prosecutions in the early days of the development of international criminal law, or let's say, the reinvigoration of international criminal law since Nuremberg and Tokyo Paris after the Second World War, having a very strong connection to uh, international human rights law and implementation to the UN. Now, to investigate, uh, we uh, conducted interviews with the usual suspects. I don't mean suspects in terms of criminal suspects, but the usual sources of information. The government of Rwanda and rebel forces, uh, the, the relevant UN agencies, the International Committee of the Red Cross, the United Delegations, of course, NGOs, survivors and witnesses, uh, as well as um, uh, conducting massacre site investigations and uh, collecting uh, documents, which turned out to be, in the end, very voluminous. Now, the Commission concluded, just to maybe uh, wrap this thread up, uh, that both sides to the conflict um, breached common Article 3 and Protocol 2. You know, we were talking about Rwanda, so that's a non-international con con conflict. And it's common Article 3 in those days that uh, we could say applies in Protocol 2. Both sides, that those are uh, the, um, the government and Hutu militia who are the main perpetrators. And the, uh, but there are also Tutsi-dominated rebel forces, the RPF coming to Uganda in those days. Both sides committed crimes against humanity in Rwanda, and that there existed overwhelming evidence to prove that acts of genocide against the Tutsi group were perpetrated by Tutsi elements in a concerted, planned, systematic, and methodical <coughs> way. Now, for a commission of experts that is not a, uh, you know, it's not a tribunal, and it's not a judicial organ, this is fairly, um, let's say, unequivocal unequivocal in some ways. It's, it's, quite, it's quite a strong thing. Abundant, abundant evidence shows that these mass exterminations perpetrated by Hutu elements against the Tutsi group as such uh, during the period mentioned about constitute genocide. It's an early call and you know saying that this is genocide. Without going through the you know the um, careful necessarily um, systematic review of evidence, but just looking at the situation and getting to the basic evidence, it's a preliminary finding in a way that is a non-judicial one, but still very important. The Security Council should amend the ICTY statute to cover also Rwanda, that was the recommendation. The idea was that the things that could be prosecuted by an international criminal tribunal, uh, and instead the Security Council acted very quickly, actually, after our report, which, which I drafted with two reports of the commissioning experts, uh, to establish the ICTR. Okay, now, to get you know, more to the precise topic, I became concerned uh, about the, the role of human rights sourced information in international criminal investigations, because in a broad sense, first of all, on the one hand, the, the commission, the commission of experts, was mandated to find ways to bring uh, criminal justice to Rwanda. They were meeting with uh, President Paul Kagame, who could say President Paul Kagame could be still president. Now the Constitution has been changed, so he can stay much longer. <laughs> Brilliant commander. Uh, on the other hand, the UN and the international community had, had just 
failed spectacularly to prevent the genocide. Uh, I don't think we, I need to enlarge upon that. I think everybody knows that or should know that. Uh, and we're talking very, really large violations uh, in terms of numbers, 500,000 to a million, uh, <coughs> seeing and moderate Hutu, uh, politically moderate uh, Hutu civilians. And the reason we can come up with more clear numbers than that is because it's very difficult uh, to establish that at the very early stage. Nowadays, you hear more like 800,000. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, that's a science in itself, determining the numbers. In any case, I remember very well that Kayami remarked, I hope you can understand, after our meeting, that we in Rwanda have learned not to expect too much from the UN. So on the one hand, we're going there saying, you know, and I was very proud to go there. Uh, you know, it's my, it was my first UN assignment and it was on the subject of my doctoral thesis, which I published in 1992. So I said, wow, this is, I'm working in my area that, that I you know, studied. Um, and um, on the one hand, there's all that pride and excitement as, as, as a new staffer. And on the other hand, this was the UN's biggest failure. And Kofi Annan has acknowledged and said that we have to do better in the future. And that gave rise to R2P and all the efforts to develop some kind of responsibility to protect. In any case, that's kind of a general context in which we were operating. More about information, however, on the one hand, we could investigate and report on the character's very scale of and responsibility for the genocide. And, you know, we did all these investigations throughout the country, seeing rather horrific uh, things. And in fact, the Guardian newspaper just uh, three or four hours ago published an article I wrote for them. Uh, so, if you have a chance, uh, feel free to, to look it up, which talks about my experiences in Rwanda. And the reason I'm talking about it now, and the reason I'm talking about it, the reason they asked me to write this article is because I, I went back to Rwanda and I stood at the same place, I was there on December 1st, where uh, in, in a massacre site investigation where I was 21 years earlier and before their old bodies. And, it was a very horrific scene, and, and now it's it's cleaned up, it's sanitized, but it's now a massacre site museum. You know, it's a, it's a thing. So the Guardian just published that uh, it's online uh, you know, three or four hours ago. If you're interested. So on the other hand, what would be done with information collected by the Commission of Experts, this Commission of Experts on Rwanda, that was established by the Security Council? and also the human rights field operation in Rwanda. One of the things that we did was establish, um, you know, from the UN side, from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, was we uh, made an agreement with the government to say, you know, we don't want to see revenge attacks. There's no ICTR yet, so we have to have genocide investigations. Uh, we need to work with the government to, to try to resurrect some form of uh, some semblance of criminal justice at the domestic level, so that took many, many years in the But one of the questions was, what, what, what's going to be done with all this information that the human rights actors of the UN are collecting on site? Will the ICTR prosecutor uh, draw upon the documents and testimonies of eyewitnesses uh, that we collected, uh, or, or, or from the forensic examinations of massacre sites and mass graves? Uh, from the many interviews. And I remember, you know, standing there, it seems like yesterday to me, you know, 21 years ago, it seems like yesterday, you know, uh, standing there with all those bodies there and thinking, what, you know, it is the, is what we're doing here is this exercise going to make any difference? And what's going to happen with this information? What, what we are seeing and, and what we are sensing in those places, how is it going to funnel into justice? It was really, you know, plus I was supposed to be, a, 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 you know, some kind of an expert, but even by then and in those days, uh, already some expertise there. But I, that's a basic question. I had no clue what would be the answer to it. So that kind of bothered me quite a lot. And that was a practical question. How does, what, what's the relationship? It took many months for the ICTR to develop the most basic investigative capacity. Of course, you know, institutions take time to be built. Um, but when the ICTR was uh, formed, and then we had you know, uh, Judge Goldstone, uh, an excellent jurist, um, 
but they seemed wary of coordinating with the Commission of Experts. Uh, the UN Special Rapporteur in Rwanda, the UN, UN Human Rights Field Operation, not to mention uh, the peacekeeping body and other UN bodies. Uh, probably, as they, and they even expressed this a bit, they wanted to ensure quality control and fact um, and to remain politically objective. The sense was, well, some of the UN organs are, um, some, you know, they represent one or other section of the international community, there's a political agenda, etc. Which, which might be partially true in some way, I'm not sure. Um, like the ad hoc tribunals, the ICC has to control its investigation evidence gathering because obviously, as you guys know, uh, the prosecution must prove criminal responsibility beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's a very high, you know, it's a high burden. Perpetrators of core crimes uh, that, that are able to carry out a systematic violation of life, you know, widespread basis are often very adept at destroying evidence and concealing identity of perpetrators. And that I think we all know as well. And not only that, but mass violations committed in time of armed conflict or serious social violence, you know, that, that complicates obviously information gathering as well and documentation. Finally, you know, one can think that uh, proving superior responsibility requires a lot of um, effort. <clears throat> And, and, and sources of information to establish formal and informal linkages uh, in the chain of command. And those linkages can be very complex and, and uh, opaque and, and very fluid because they change over time. You know, what is the person's relation of uh, command hierarchy? Not only that, but the ICC cannot be everywhere at once for resource logistical security limitations. Uh, this is some of our investigations that all infants slaughtered, slaughtered in a row. And then there's a standing there. Um, so the ICC has to gather not only first-hand testimonies and eyewitness accounts, but also does have to gather information from the UN and our regional organizations and NGOs operating in affected areas. And those human NGOs are often, are mainly, usually, human rights and humanitarian NGOs, they're, they are the first ones on the scene. You know, criminal investigators may take a long time to show up if they ever do show up for all sorts of reasons. UN human rights fact finding differs from ICC fact finding because human rights fact finding relates mainly to the responsibility of the state. Uh, rebel movements, the way they succeed in forcing <coughs> government, you know, under international law and not individual criminal responsibility, even as regards serious violations. Um, it also focuses mainly on human rights situation, situation as a whole, rather than on individual cases, except with regard to illustrating patterns of defense. Even where it's dealing with individual communications, the purpose, they thrust, is to hold the state responsible. That's really the main thrust of international human rights law and implementation. Uh, and to pressure governments, or maybe the territorial authority and the special control, to abide by their obligations and ensure that victims receive regrets for violations, prevent future violations. Okay, those two points are obviously very similar or overlap to the goals of international human rights. But the point is that human rights fact finding is mainly focused on establishing international international <coughs> wrongful act of the state, the state responsibility. In contrast, international criminal uh, fact-finding or investigation relates mainly to the relevant statute mandate, obviously, if it's an ad hoc tribunal or the ICC, the wrong statute, focuses on individual criminal responsibility rather than state responsibility. But it has to take account of the position of the individual in a formal or actual state hierarchy as well as the existing state policy. So it obviously has to organize and focus on the relationship of individuals within the overall state and um, state attribution of the wrongfulness of the, of the state's action could be relevant in some cases, which we'll, we'll, we'll see them in a little here. <clears throat> Moreover, they differ as regards bur burden of proof. 
international criminal trials beyond a reasonable doubt, in line with fair trial standards. Um, but in non-criminal cases on state responsibility, the International Court of Justice requires something less than that, maybe proof at a high level of certainty appropriate to the seriousness of the allegation. That's we get that from the ICJ judgment and genocide case by the Canadian. Non-criminal cases involving state responsibility for an ordinary wrong uh, might be proven on a balance of probabilities. It's even a lower standard. You know, it's more likely than not that this happened. It's a much different um, burden of proof to prove your case. Special procedural requirements for criminal trials. Uh, as you well know, <clears throat> ICC trials have to apply higher admissibility standards of evidence to preserve the presumption of innocence of the accused and ensure a fair trial. Whereas human rights fact-finding on information in the public, only in the public domain, uh, that's not true for criminal prosecutions, and much of the information um, has to be kept confidential, and there has to be an unbroken chain of custody. That just doesn't apply in the same way, if at all, usually not, it doesn't apply at all, in human rights fact-finding. <clears throat> In short, human rights fact-finding is usually more general, less rigorous than criminal investigations. It's a different kind of thing. All right. Now, the, the fact that human rights fact-finding is more general, less precise, and less burdened by strict procedural requirements than prosecutions sometimes has led uh, international criminal investigators, or prosecutors, to say, what is the value of this stuff to get from Human Rights Watch, the UN Human Rights Council, the Special Rapporteur, you know, can we really use this? What is this stuff here? What, what use is it? You know, can we take this stuff to the court? Who knows where it came from? And that's a very common uh, reaction that, that you know, occurred. However, if we look at the ICTY's and ICTR's experience, um, particularly in regard to the Security Council's Commission of Experts, investigative procedures, we will uh, see that there are limitations on, on the use of human rights sourced information for international criminal prosecutions. But there's also potentialities, and I want to highlight both of these in some detail. Before we go on, I can take a very quick question, very quick though, okay. uh, or if there's something unclear, let's put it that way. We'll take questions afterwards. Is there anything unclear to this point? Otherwise, I'll barrel ahead like a, a train out of control. Is anything unclear, or is it as clear as mud so far? Anything bothering you? That, no? Okay, if not, I'll continue the argument and we'll have questions later. Okay? Okay, in both the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, human rights special procedures, fact-finding mechanisms, acted first as precursors, you know, something that went ahead, uh, of the establishment of the ad hoc international criminal tribunals, which obviously are the ICTY and the ICTR. And then as conduits of information, <coughs> so first as precursors to further establishment, and then, you know, channels of information. The UN Commission on Human Rights, as it was then called and now it's the UN Human Rights Council, appointed special rapporteurs to report on the scale and character of the violations. Uh, you had a special rapporteur on the former Yugoslavia and one for Rwanda. And those reports from those individuals uh, helped to establish that violations were so serious and they should be considered as crimes under international law and prosecuted internationally because of the domestic unwillingness to prosecute or inability. So um, those, the, the establishment of the ad hoc tribunals would not have gone very far without this kind of pathway from the human rights side. The Security Council Commission of Experts were based on Chapter 7, as I said, to investigate the British Later on, more recently, and I'll uh, recall this a little bit later, Human rights, the Human Rights Council has created commissions of inquiry 
that are mandated to open possible commission of court claims. All right. So these commissions of experts, which were supported by the uh, UN Center for Human Rights, coordinated with human rights field presence to, to do these things. So let's skip over this very quickly. Basically, investigation, uh, continue investigations, do monitoring, provide technical cooperation. Here's what I want to get into, which is really some of the meat of this. As uh, Sharif Asliuni concedes, most of the information gathered or received by the uh, former Yugoslav Commission of Experts could not be used directly as evidence. First of all, the, the UN agencies and, and also the ICRC didn't consider it their mandate to just go around collecting evidence. That was not their mandate. So they didn't necessarily pay attention to what they were collecting in that sense. And they also weren't sure whether to give any of this information to the commissions of experts who were mandated by, mandated by the Security Council. They said, well, the Security Council gave them that mandate, but do we have to cooperate with them? The Security Council said, yes, they still weren't sure. The parties to the conflict had limited resources and did not have trained personnel to collect such information. Okay, the, the government, uh, in some cases, or the uh, rebel forces. Governments were also unsure, other governments were unsure whether they should cooperate with the UN Commission of Experts uh, in, in each case, or have little politi political effort to do that. NGOs were concerned to keep the identity of their sources confidential, so they didn't uh, cooperate either that much. Information often came without a clear record. If whatever information that came in came without a clear record of its provenance, what was its source. So if you don't know the source of your information or you can't prove it, how could you induce it? Uh, into evidence. So it became inadmissible hearsay. There were one the commission of experts, um, you know, thousands of pages of documents, letters, written translation testimony, and that <coughs> three, those three persons said in the limited staff that we had, uh, we could not analyze all this information in 90 days. It's very difficult to do. <coughs> Moreover, effective fact-finding on the genocide, which involved many thousands of victims and perpetrators, could not all be done by the UN uh, you know, bodies. For example, the Special Rapporteur on Rwanda. That was one person with the staff of one or two. But they couldn't do it either. Uh, just too many violations. And um, so that led to the Commission of Experts, UN Human Rights Field Operation, most of the information gathering, uh, and there are problems of internal coordination and, and, and how to operate, which I won't go into much. <clears throat> All right, so <clears throat> the point I'm making here is that the ICTY and ICTR experience shows that it was quite unrealistic to expect human rights information to be used as evidence directly in international prosecutions. So UN, uh, let's say UN bodies, that are human rights bodies, or human rights NGOs, can't just take the information that they have, which is often very relevant or pertinent in terms of the substance, and then you turn it into evidence, because it's not properly sourced. Uh, it, you can't trace the, the deponent of the, of the, uh, that gave the information, and uh, get the witness back, cross-examine, perhaps examination, et cetera. So, it's information you can use somehow, but not directly in that sense. For, for, I just said this, individual witnesses could not be identified or be traced. People didn't take down the information you know, thoroughly because they weren't thinking of criminal prosecutions. Databases and archive, archiving were hardly computerized. I showed them on the side computer, and that's almost what we had in the Center for Human Rights in 1994. Um, there were three computers. That, I got one because it's urgency of this thing. There were two others. Um, but human rights sources are critical to ascertain which situations around the globe might call for preliminary criminal investigation. Because the ICC, on the other hand, cannot, on its own, monitor the entire globe for, for serious violations. It's difficult to do that. It's a complex you know, planet with um, very complex situations and a lot of human rights violations. So many countries. Um, 
So human rights sources also help to establish trends and patterns in violations, you know, over time, monitoring and investigation reporting from human rights sites, to establish also whether there were uh, widespread or systematic attacks, human rights NGOs, for example, and, and UN and uh, domestic and regional human rights bodies do this very well. They actually detect uh, patterns and trends quite well um, and, and see whether they're widespread or systematic. And that could be very obviously important for the crimes against humanity threshold in the Rome Statute. <clears throat> whether civilians were the target of crimes against humanity or war crimes, is obviously an important element for the Rome Statute. And you know the role of commanders or superiors in state-sponsored atrocities. Similarly with uh, Darfur, and uh, uh, information from UN human rights sources was very uh, important to the ICC's in information gathering. Uh, and whether or not, uh, you know, the decision whether or not to initiate an investigation into the situation. And the pretrial's chamber's endorsement on uh, whether or not to proceed with an investigation. Uh, human rights sources, again, were very important there. So, and of course, as you know, one of the elements is that the uh, domestic courts, um, you know, for complementarity principle, have to be in a position that they're unwilling or unable before you can proceed. And who can determine that? It's again, the UN human rights sources and NGOs help with that too. You know, the independence of the judiciary, the, there are mandates on that from the UN Human Rights Council, uh, and to look at the, you know, the history of, of uh, the conduct of the judiciary, the, ICC would normally not do that for, for all countries, but the UN Human Rights Council, it's watching the, the globe uh, because of the universal periodic reviews, special procedures mandates, UN treaty bodies that, that, that exist in Geneva. So there are all these sources of information. UN special investigative procedures help pave the way for ICC prosecutions. And there have been a lot of these with regard to Darfur. And, um, you know, the uh, International Commission of Inquiry, for my liking, is maybe one of the best, you know, one of the best done reports from the Security Council mandated team at side about uh, you know, the kind of thing that went on in Darfur, run by, um, <coughs> headed by Antonio Cassetti. And they, they even sent a list of likely suspects in a sealed file to the uh, Secretary General and to um, the High Commissioner of Human Rights. But there are all sorts of other mechanisms out there. Human Rights Council's high level mission on the human rights situation in Darfur. And um, that determined whether the Sudanese courts were unable or unwilling to pursue the after of that attack. Obviously, that's important for um, proceeding to the ICC. Yeah, the Council and Human Rights Council. In, in December 2007, uh, there was a whole group of experts on Darfur. I was the coordinator for that body. Uh, and it documented ongoing serious violations in the final report. And once the security situation had driven many NGOs out of Darfur, um, everybody had to rely more on information from the government of the Sudan itself, the human rights components of the African Union and the uh, peacekeeping and other UN agencies and bodies and programs in the field. So the point is that um, whereas the ICTY and ICTR and ICTY prosecutors, prosecutors initially may not have trusted the integrity and probative value of basic human rights information gathered by various uh, other human, uh, UN sources. In Sudan, it's a little bit different situation because the government wouldn't cooperate with the ICC, if anything, and oppose it. That obliged the prosecutor to rely more heavily on UN fact-finding mechanisms from the human rights side, the ICRT and NGOs, and witnesses who fled the country. We couldn't really do much in situ. I think we all know that. Thus, the, these international responses from these examples um, show that, you know, let's just say they shed some light or give some less, uh, lessons on the relationship between human rights and ICC uh, you know, investigations. First, 
human rights investigators in Rwanda did not fully appreciate what kind of information would be useful for criminal investigators, or how to obtain it, how to preserve its integrity. You know, chain of evidence, chain of evidence. Um, one of my colleagues gave an example that sticks in my mind. He said, you know, human rights people sometimes say, well, there's, there's a missile, you know? Let's take a photo of this. There's a missile there. So they take a photo of it, and uh, there it is, and they say, this is what this is what happened. And people say, well, okay, criminal investigators will say, why don't you put a compass and a ruler so we know what is the caliber and, and check it out and take a closer up picture as well. And, and the direction is important. What's coming from the rebel side, what's coming from the government side. Without that, what's the use? It's a piece of metal. And, you know, it's not, it's not that important. And Darfur, rather more reliance on human rights sources rather than on uh, criminal, traditional criminal investigation sources. Okay. The Human Rights Council investigations into situations have become more, not less, frequent. So criminal, you know, kind of criminal investigation style, criminal style investigations um, are being done more by the UN Human Rights Council than they have done in the past, not less, even though we have the ICC. And if you don't believe it, let's look at the examples. We have the Gaza conflict, fact-finding mission. We have Commission of Inquiry in Cote d'Ivoire. We have the International Commission of Inquiry on Libya. And we have the UN Human Rights Council's investigation of Syria. On the other hand, you know, there have not been too many more after that. Uh, we have to check in. There's a few more, perhaps, but maybe that was a, an aberration. But that's still a, a lot, quite a few, which concern themselves not just with traditional human rights and you know, state responsibility, but also which individuals, commanders, government, ministers, uh, individuals on, you know, on the ground who are you know, shooting civilians, are responsible, and even compiling lists, etc. Okay. Fortunately, I would say, UN human rights fact-finding and international criminal investigations, uh, these two you know, different kinds of investigation, the fact-finding, they're, they're showing signs of rapprochement. Uh, in the sense that human rights council mandate holders and OHCHR staff today, uh, I would say, recognize much more than they have in the past that their findings could figure possibly as evidence in international criminal prosecutions. So they have to be more precise and they have to guard chain of custody. And there's a, there's a chance that some of the information that they're getting could be eventually, uh, possibly, adduced as evidence. On the other side, the ICC has explicitly recognized the value of the UN human rights fact funding. For example, in uh, the Katanga and case where you have um, high-level Congolese militia leaders for war crimes and crimes against humanity. The defense tried to exclude UN human rights officers' testimony on grounds of unreliability. The defense said, hey, this information that you got implicating my client, it's not right, it's coming from a human rights source. Ha uh ha. -huh. And the, the court said, wait a second, um, the reports are relevant to the court's mandate, and there was no question as to their authenticity. And that with the aid of the deponent's oral testimony, the probative value could be assessed. And that's what they're calling for the court, to assess the, 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 uh, the capacity of the evidence. It's a funny way to put it. Let's see, the, the, its probative value, its uh, value in terms of proving the case, right? One way or another. And the chamber said, well, coming from the OHCHR, and it's relevant, and it's evidence. For more detailed arguments on all this stuff, I just recommend, uh, in case you're interested, uh, three articles I've written that focus much more detail than I can get into um, today. This is maybe some kind of a uh, taste of, of maybe what I'm driving at. Um, and. Uh, I invite you, if you want to visit my website, you can find more writings on this and on related areas uh, that get into this to this area. So now we've got exactly 15 minutes, which is, you know, <laughs> so they all try to do it. <laughs> Thank you very, very much for your attention. If you have any questions or um, 
any comments you want to make, please, uh, please feel free. Yes. Um, hello, my name is uh, Shami Zhou, and um, I work along with some other colleagues um, in the Jurisdiction Cooperation Division of the office. Thank you for your presentation, it was very interesting. Um, I actually have two comments uh, coming out of um, my uh, particular experience here in the last five years, um, specifically in my division. Um, which deals with the UN and other partners um, in trying to facilitate um, the kinds of exchanges you're talking about. Um, one comment, um, which is a general comment, is that um, I think one of the concerns that I have, um, and I'm not sure how it can be addressed, um, is that in certain instances when you have um, UN endorsed, or perhaps not even UN endorsed, um, but independent um, uh, commissions of inquiry um, uh, that, as you say, are uh, first responders and are the first people to get to a particular place where there is a conflict, um, and then to gather information, um, but as you point out, analyze that information um, from a lower with, with, a, with a lower threshold than we would ourselves. Um, my concern is that sometimes those commissions of inquiry, notwithstanding the lower burden um, by which they are um, receiving, uh, weighing information, will still come to a conclusion. Um, so I'm thinking here specifically about Guatemala and the commission there, concluding that genocide happens. And my concern is that um, that creates expectations amongst the victim population, which then becomes very difficult for um, ICC because people can't always distinguish um, between um, our juridical finding of whether or not there's genocide. Which is much higher than the one that's- Which is much higher- common parties. Yeah, yes, sure. than a commission yep. coming and saying, we believe genocide happened here. Um, so, so one issue um, that I have with um, Commissions of inquiry taking on more and more um, sort of forensic um, analysis of what is happening and coming to conclusions about crimes occurring is that it creates expectations um, that um, may make it more difficult for um, the ICC to explain what we're doing when we come and then struggle um, to necessarily meet all the, the the elements of a particular crime, yep. but people in that place believe the crime happened. Yeah, and, right. and this applies yeah. to crimes against humanity as well. Sure, I, I have something to say about that. Did you have another concern? Or was that a question? That's one comment. Okay. Um, and then the other comment, um, which is also about perceptions, is that um, uh, I've also found that um, Sometimes it's a, it's a liability as well. On the one hand, it's obviously very useful for the office to have as much information from as many sources as possible. Whether it's a Human Rights Watch report on what's happening in Libya, um, in particular in areas where we may not have access, or it's um, Philip Alston's report on extrajudicial killings in Kenya uh, before the ICC got involved, and I actually worked for Philip. Um, I was his research assistant for a few years when he was um, he's a great guy. I know he's a wonderful person. In his capacity as UN Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Killings. Okay. But whatever the case, we often find great value in all these reports from Cote d'Ivoire Commission of Inquiry, etc. However, one um, liability is that for the affected population, um, I think it's easier for a particular party to discredit a report of a Commission of Inquiry, a party in the conflict. Um, one of the difficulties we find coming into these situations afterwards is that um, there's often the perception that the ICC is simply building on the prior report, which was flawed. Right. So, for example, in Cote d'Ivoire, people think the UN was a party to this conflict, so the Commission of Inquiry is tainted, and the ICC is just an extension of this foreign intervention um, that is party to the conflict all people's problems with Cassesi's report. Sure. And then it's very difficult for us to say, actually we're neutral, we're independent, we're doing investigations, 
from scratch because there's this perception that the ICC is simply building on what we already did. Right, right, right. Could I comment on both of those? Yes, please. Those are excellent questions, and um, you know, I agree with much of what you said in both of those. I would say that um, it's incumbent upon uh, the commissions of experts that are formed, that are established, therefore to use these terms rather carefully. And in the case of Rwanda, we said that there's, there, there's overwhelming evidence to prove, and that's why I put the, the quote up there. And they're sure that creates expectations, but on the other hand, you're sitting there with a lot of evidence, and you need to get the process going in those cases, uh, without making any judicial finding. And, I don't think anybody had a uh, had the uh, you know the illusion that we were a judicial body. Nobody in the field considered us such. They knew we were doing preliminary work. So, um, but I, I, your your point is very well taken, and that is that um, commissioners have to be uh, in the, these commission of experts uh, have to be very careful uh, not to raise expectations to to box in later bodies, especially you know the ICC. So there is there is a danger there. I would rather see more information out than, uh, than less. Uh, and you don't have a lot of choice in the sense that these bodies are easily and quickly deployed. And often we need, practically speaking, we can't wait for uh, two or three years to see whether the ICC or, or an ad hoc tribunal might be able to, to uh, be deployed because you know, evidence will be lost. I mean, Political will moves on, etc. So, you need something, but you have to have it. You have to have this uh, concern of yours, which I think, I think we should all share. Is correct, not to make um, ironclad or uh, determinations, knowing that it's not a judicial body and it hasn't gone through. You know, the the standards. I think everybody knows for the NFA convention are very high, and to prove it, it's, it's difficult. I think that's why um, Antonio Cassese uh, wouldn't use. What, when looking at the situation in Darfur, and from what I do, and having coordinated, you know, a body in, uh, in the UN on Darfur, um, I think there was a lot of evidence to show that it was, uh, you know, a, a, a good case could be made, a strong case for genocide. And he's right till the end would never uh, concede that it was genocide or say that it was. And I think he, I don't want to criticize him, but I think he did an excellent report, I think one of the best reports. But he said um, there is no something like there's no evidence um, to prove it. Therefore, we cannot say it was genocide. He put it in such a way that the um, you couldn't say that it might be genocide unless you had enough evidence to say to show that there was. It's better to say we don't know whether it's genocide, and that has to be determined. Simply that. Um, so I think he was a little bit too conservative there. But and your second concern was the. Um, Cote d'Ivoire, etc. There, I don't have an easy answer because I think you you made a really excellent argument there that the UN was seen as some in some way allied uh, for good reasons with one side or the other, and we know that. And um, but you know the ICC and and the public itself, that's also very evident. I think if people don't confuse uh, the UN that being a judicial body of some sort. Uh, okay, the ICJ is one thing, but uh, you know the, the political organs of the you know the UN Human Rights Council, the Security Council. People know that, but you're right. So the the, the two points you're making are that um, from the human rights side, uh, the expectation shouldn't be very uh, you know easily tossed out there. And I, I haven't seen that too much, but there is a risk, and um, I think it's a very important concern that you raised in both your questions. And we. And to the second one, um, again, I don't have a, a, a real good answer because I think you're right about that. So, uh, go ahead, and I'll come to you. So thanks for those questions; they're really good. Yeah, go ahead. Hi. Uh, thank you, first of all, for uh, the amazing lecture. I actually have two quick questions, but uh, the first one, and it's, it's going to be really quick. The first one is related to the ICTR, and the second one is to the Human Rights Council. Sure. Um, the first one, in relation to the ICTR, I wanted to know your own assessment, given that you took part in the report of the record of the ICTR in general, given that you said, as you said, there was um, evidence that both parties committed crimes, yet the ICTR did not investigate any of the Kagame kind of crimes. And the second one, really quick, is uh, related to the Human Rights Council. 
And I was um, wondering, and I guess it connects to the second point that she made, um, how reliable can a human rights council be seen in investigating crimes such as the ones in Yemen after um, Saudi Arabia has been appointed as the head, and it clearly has a lot to do in the crimes committed in Yemen and whatnot. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much. In fact, the, the mission that I was sent, uh, you know, in uh, October 29, 1994, was to determine, uh, with the Commission of Experts, was mainly to determine whether there were violations on the RPF side in Rwanda, and we found that uh, there were violations, but they weren't clearly of the same systematic character or severity or, or frequency, and, and the numbers of victims were much uh, smaller from the RPF side, uh, but there were violations. So it, it bothers me a little bit. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, um, I was just at the Arusha closing ceremonies in, uh, in, in December, and uh, you know, we have what, 91 or 93 um, individuals' uh, you know, cases, and 61 um, found guilty. Um, first of all, for me, that's a very small number when you compare it to the thousands of perpetrators. So, but at least they're symbolic, and it's also a high, higher number than we've seen in Nuremberg and Tokyo. And they're frustrated with the slow pace of justice. That, that's a frustration. But you know, it takes time for institutions to build. But I am disappointed that no, no individuals from the RPF side uh, were, were prosecuted because um, they would have shown, you know, that there were some people that uh, committed uh, crimes under international law and should have been. Uh, prosecuted, and on the uh, UN Human Rights Council, um, the UN Human Rights Council is a political body, and it is about 47 member states. It's not a judicial institution. So what it can do is is react quickly as, as the international community needs something to react quickly, um, you know, to to get a, a, to reckon with the situation, but um, be rather discreet in some ways, and not make too many pronouncements. It's, it's a very fine um, balance. It's not, it's not that easy. And it, you know, when you look at the Commission of Inquiry on Syria uh, under Sergio Pinheiro, who's an excellent human rights um, personality, I mean, he, he's a little bit locked, this is my personal opinion, but he's a little bit locked into a difficult pattern because it's difficult, uh, if possible, to gain access to Syria for security conditions. And um, so the, the reports are starting to repeat themselves. I think we're up to the 12th or 13th or 14th. And they're finding the, the, that these violations were committed and these violations were committed and et cetera, and that uh, you know, um, these are crimes under international law, very likely, but there's not much more that can be done at that stage. Um, and it's building some political will, perhaps, but you know, we know that things are deadlocked in the Security Council. But it's one more method of pressure, so it's a political process. Did that answer what was your question? Yeah. Uh, sh sure, I was just wondering if they actually did a, a commission of inquiry in Yemen, given that Saudi Arabia is leading the council. And of course it's political, but it's also one of the major parties involved in Yemen. How how can it be seen on the ground, or the level of collaboration that you can have? Yeah, on that, it really depends on the dynamics of, uh, you know, people think that uh, um, from Gran, Gran Salas, you know, it, it's, it's a political body, and you do have maybe Saudi Arabia, or before we had Libya, we had the UN Commission on Human Rights, and it is a political body. So knowing that, people have to say, well, this, uh, we hope that the, um, the, the experts appointed and the commissions of inquiry that are established are quite independent and objective. But they've been quite criticized. I mean, you've seen, if you just do a Google search, you'll see uh, a lot of criticism, for example, of the commission of inquiry in Gaza. And it was uh, very serious criticism and some embarrassment um, because it, they've been attacked quite a lot. So it's, it's not an easy uh, thing, but pe people are aware that this is the UN political uh, framework and that there are states involved. It's a state-led um, you know, led process, it's not a judicial process. So that's the only way I think to analyze it. Uh, but on the other hand, we don't have, I think, a good option to say we're not going to go in that direction because we need something. So it's, it's got to play its role, but it's, got, not, it's important to use human rights processes to build political will and to get attention, but not to go too far in, you know, 
trying to prove responsibility, maybe identifying some possible perpetrators under sealed file is okay. But not to issue uh, some comments, well, you know, the president is responsible, or looks responsible, this and that, or making ironclad uh, uh, findings on, on, on genocide or other things. But on the other hand, some of these early calls, as long as they're not overdone, could be useful in bringing, building support, because what, the problem we have now in the international community is that there's there's too much laxity. There are all sorts of violations going on, and it takes a long time for the states to say, oh, here we go again. It's another big conflict. We really want to send, send our soldiers over there, and they have to be pressured, and public opinion must be marshaled. So from that point of view, the human rights processes are brilliant for doing that. But then they shouldn't overstep uh, their, their responsibility and their bounds in terms of fact-finding. And that's why they have to be used, I would say, for background, for context, but not go too far. That would meet your concerns, which I think were very well articulated. Go ahead. Maybe last question, because then we're we're at five. Go ahead. I live in New York. Of course, you're lucky. You guys get microphones and stuff. My name is Emma. Please. My name is Emma. I'm based in New York. We didn't know what I was going <laughs> it's not my um, I have I have two questions. Uh, one is if you can comment and uh, about uh, the commission on the commission and its praise for its authority and I should have mentioned it there. Um, and I don't know if you have anything that will be seen actual information that they will be that. Yeah. And then from empirically what you've seen, um, you mentioned now that the, the way the mandate of the commission Particular political context, sometimes the security council, sometimes the human rights council, as where are opportunities. So there is really no science as to why or. But has there been an impact into the source of the, of the mandate um, with respect to the to the impact that the findings may have, follow up on the particular project, and that is there some uh, correlation to having a preference for the other? Yeah, thanks. Uh, on DPRK, the, um, I think the, uh, and I haven't followed extremely carefully, but what, from what I've seen, the methodology has been what, what could be done. I mean, uh, you know, my, my colleague, Viti Mutabar, who was on it, and, and it was a crazy video, um, their, their, their uh, procedure was to, you know, get a hold of people as they were crossing the border to interview them, that's one of the main ones. In addition to the traditional, uh, you know, fact-finding things, I mean, you know, through organizations, through contacts. But actually waiting at the border, I mean, you know, they have some organizations to help with that. And getting people um, with their stories, I think was quite innovative. Although that was done also in, uh, with regard to, uh, the UN Human Rights Office has done that for a long time. They've often gone around the border. For example, in Syria, they're going around Turkey. And, and in the time of Saddam Hussein, it was around uh, the borders uh, to interview people. And, and refugees and refugee councils. And I remember on Iran, I was working on Iran for a while. We, we interviewed uh, you know, the exile government, so called exile government, and, and this and that. So interviewing people outside, and the same thing had to be done for uh, Darfur and other places. Um, so, you know, it's um, it's interesting to see also the the tenor of uh, you know of that commission has been very strong and vocal. Uh, and that's another working method to try to build some uh, some some will there. Um, but I won't say much more on DP, DPRK on the commission required there. What I could say on on uh, the relationship between you know these commissions of experts from the Security Council or commissions of experts and or, and or inquiry from the Human Rights Council side, what is the feedback loop is what you're really asking. And it's an important one because these are mandated to report back and then to, on that basis of the report, to do something. And so it's a very clear uh, linkage to say, well, look, uh, now you've gone to Rwanda and you've, you've uh, gone to you know, massacre sites and, and you've seen what, and you've gathered evidence and talked to people and, from a very wide, uh, comprehensive array of sources, you can say that there seems to be you know, a case to make, uh, you know, in the case of, of Rwanda, 
uh, genocide from one party and crimes against humanity and uh, uh, common rights and freedom violations on both sides. And that could help the international community say, yeah, in this case, we really need an ad hoc tribunal. And that's why on November 8, uh, 1994, the Security Council was very, very quickly after that. So it, it, it was an important way, uh, step forward. Otherwise, you're, you're sitting in the Security Council, and one country says, you know, we, we really have to create a, a tribunal, and you've got other opposite opinions, and for different reasons. And I don't want to go into the politics of the time, which are quite, uh, let's say, uh, you know, vexing to think about, even now, uh, that we're there in the Security Council. And I don't want to even go into that. But um, you need something that says, look, we've seen the bodies. We have to do when we went there. We've seen the bodies. We've gone to by helicopter from place to place to place, and we've seen from witnesses and everything that's, you know, this this is a situation and we need a tribunal. So that that's the feedback with the Security Council, and I just want to maybe highlight something is that the reason that a lot of the commission of inquiry now are going to be done from the, from the Human Rights Council is for um, I think a very interesting reason, and that is that when you get one uh, permanent member, you know, Captain Deal, uh, and you don't get enough uh, agreement on the Security Council, it would be preferable to have Chapter 7, which is binding on all the UN member states, right? That would be the best thing. But um, when that doesn't work, what's your other option? Well, I guess you could go through the General Assembly, that's very difficult. Uniting for Peace Resolution, something like that. But you can't do that, and that's part of the You go to the UN Human Rights Council because you need only a majority of 47 member states, and you, you know, the discussions are public, but where does it get you? The UN Human Rights Council, it's easier to give a mandate, it's easier to send people there and get reports out, but then it's not, it's not compulsory in terms of uh, the Human Rights Council, or what, it, what it passes, resolutions are non binding <coughs> Because it's political, number one. And, and number two, um, you know, you you uh, you, you, you can't establish an ad hoc tribunal, or we're even refer the situation to the ICC because it's you know that way it is the wrong statute. So that means that it's easier to take something to the council because you don't there, the, there's no veto there, but then you can do less with it. So what is the value of the UN Human Rights Council in these kind of cases? It's again building awareness, putting it on record, getting the reports out. And, and, and getting something out there, otherwise you have an enormous gap between just having journalistic accounts and situations and the, the ICC. Like you have very little in between. You have NGOs and journalists and people talking about it. So you need something to fill it in, and that's always been the UN Human Rights Organs. They do that very well, as long as they don't know what's their balance. So I've overstepped my balance. In eight uh, after five or ten after five. I apologize for spilling over, but in my defense, we started at ten after. It's now eight after, so I saved you two minutes from what we're promised to me. So I'll give those two minutes back to hands. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alayo. It was a really, really interesting, great presentation with uh, some impressive uh, illustrations, I must say. Uh, I think we can see from the questions that it was also very inspiring. Uh, and uh, I have no doubt that if we had more time, if we had had more time, there would have been plenty more questions, which uh, in the end will probably only be a guarantee that uh, discussions uh, of this nature will continue. And I'm looking forward to that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.